Thanks for listening to the Belonging House Fellowship Podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto and the House of Artisans. One of the best classes I remember when I was a student was a course called The Impact of Science on Society. And in that class, I had a very, very rudimentary introduction to quantum physics. I know just enough to be dangerous. I know very little, but I know enough to be interested. And one of the things I learned was that some subatomic particles are changed when they are observed. Hmm. And of course, this is very befuddling and troubling to physicists because they cannot prove something when it changes every time you look at it. Mm-hmm. And here's an interesting thing. This is one of the principles of the kingdom. Whatever you look at grows. Paul says something like this in his letter to T- Titus. To the pure, all things are pure. Mm-hmm. To the corrupt and unbelieving, all things are impure. In other words, we're back to the grid, back to our grids. We call this confirmation bias. If you make up your mind to see things a certain way, then all things will line up with your grid. A few chapters before today's gospel reading, Jesus is in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And they're afraid and they're discussing Because they do not have enough food. They're like, who forgot to pack the bread? Now, here's the interesting context. They are in the boat, traveling, right after they fed the 5,000. Some of you know, I just went to Israel, and God provided miraculously. Uh, I needed $2,400. In the end... I just was doing the math this morning. The Lord brought in 4,000. And yet, I'm back doing my day-to-day in the UK, day-to-day in London. And what am I worried about? How am I going to pay for the next train ticket? How am I going to pay for the next room? And I'm struggling with God providing. So this is so it's not unique to I'm just saying that the disciples aren't unique. We're all like that. And Jesus notices this in the disciples. And his response to them is very surprising. It's not what you think. He says, "Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod." In this case, yeast was defilement that would come in and grow. And what is this defilement? This defilement is disbelief. Getting a human perspective. And he points out two perspectives that are the root of disbelief. The first perspective is the perspective of the Pharisees. This is the religious grid. As we've seen through the interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees, their perspective is about doing the right outward thing to please God. And the interesting thing is you can never do enough to please God. And they believe that if you perform the law perfectly, this would force God to usher in the messianic kingdom and vindicate Israel. The basic idea is manipulation. That if you perform certain actions, they will make God do something. And of course, you have to make God happy. So you have to do these things to make God happy. You have to do something to make God answer your prayers. It's an attempt to manipulate God into answering your prayer. It's the key. It's the core of this. And it's interesting because the Pharisees are the, uh, the precursor to modern Judaism. When you go to Israel and you deal with the ultra-Orthodox, you see this right before your eyes. There are still people doing this, but not just in the Jewish community. 
The second grid is the grid of the Herodians. In another place, the Herodians are linked to the Sadducees. This is the party in Israel that believed that Herod was the true king of Israel and that the Herodian line should be in charge instead of the Romans. And they were mostly Greek-oriented. They were what we would call Hellenists. They were assimilators with the Greco-Roman culture. But they wanted a political vindication of Israel. They believed that Israel should be independent in a military and political sense. This is the grid that says you have to manipulate people to get them to agree with you and then have power over them in order to make something happen. So it's still control, manipulation, and domination. And Jesus says to the disciples in the boat, after they've fed 5,000 and are worried about how they're going to get bread in the boat, beware of the political and the religious grid. These are earth-centered, man-centered points of view. And whatever you look at is going to get bigger. The disciples had completely forgotten that 5,000 people were fed with five loaves and two fish and that they had 12 baskets full. They each could have brought a basket full of bread onto this boat. You realize this. And Jesus did this by giving thanks, breaking bread, and giving it away. Interesting. So here, in Matthew 22, a few chapters later, these two parties, the Pharisees and the Herodians, and this is why I say this, because sometimes when you pay attention to these patterns in the Gospels, you start to see the scripture interpret itself. So we see the Pharisees, and then the key is the Herodians, join forces to trap Jesus in his words. What's interesting is that if Jesus was not there, these two parties would not get along. They'd be arguing with each other. But, but they have a common enemy. And what is the common enemy? The common enemy is the kingdom of God, which will make both of these parties redundant, as they say in the UK, without work. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. So the Pharisees and the Herodians come forward. So the Pharisees and the Herodians come forward about paying taxes to Caesar. They want to trap Jesus. Because they know that if he says, don't pay your taxes, he's breaking the law, the Roman law. And he says, if you do pay your taxes, you're going to offend all the Jews who don't want to pay their taxes. And they also know that he's not on either of their sides. He's not lining up with the party line. He isn't about overthrowing the Romans, and he isn't about keeping all the religious rules. So they come forward and they ask him, is it lawful for the Jews to pay the annual tribute to Caesar? Is it lawful? Is it against, is it against the political law or is it against the Torah? And in the Greek, it says, they spread a net to trap him. And Jesus does something no one expects. And this is one of those places where these modern translations are bad when it just says he asked for a coin. No, he asked for a specific coin. This was a coin minted in particular for the payment of the tax. And out of the pocket, of one of these Pharisees, someone produces a denarius. These folks are using Roman currency and they have it on their person. So right there, he's trapped them. And then he asks them, whose image is on the coin? 
And of course, they know by implication. Even these ultra-Orthodox Pharisees know that by having the coin, they're traitors to their own cause. They're part of the system that they're calling into question. And the most interesting thing here is that Jesus says, whose image and whose inscription is on the coin? See, there's always the details are the sticking points in these stories. It's a very interesting detail. And if you go and you look up online, and you can, because this is a very common coin, they were used up until about 1000 AD. They were still floating around. The inscription on that coin says, Caesar is God. And so Jesus, imagine this, presenting a coin to God in the flesh and saying, should we pay taxes to this man who says he's a God, who by this time is dead? And Jesus looks at them, and essentially, he asks them a question. They understand the question he's asking. It's the question that Joshua asked the people of Israel in Joshua chapter 1. Choose you this day whom you will serve. It's the question that Elijah asked them. Who's God? And Jesus says, well... It's his coin. Give to him what's his. But give to God what's God's. If you're in the world system, then you have to play by the world system. God owns everything. God made everything. Give to God what's rightfully his. Or take up your cross and follow me and lose your life in this world. There isn't a political solution. There's not a religious solution. Neither of those worldly-centered things are going to solve Israel's problems. My kingdom, Jesus is saying, is not of this world. But your factions are of this world. And with this, they set out to kill him. One thing I find really interesting is that the more focused on the world system people become, the more important cash is to them. You know, and cash is just a tool. Cash is useful, but it becomes a god. The interesting thing is politics do too. It's very, very interesting. Politics become a god very quickly to people. This episode here, as I said at the beginning, is about perspective. Are you going to see it all from the kingdom perspective? Or is every question a religious question? Is it a question about the right way to do it, how much to do it, and keeping all the rules and doing all the right stuff to make God happy? Or is it about politics? Is it about manipulating and influencing people to your camp in order to get your way? I find the most interesting thing about the news and the media are the stories that get left out or the pieces they don't tell you. And it's really interesting if you get more than one perspective. You start to see that, oh, they left out a large piece of information. Why did they do that? They do that to manipulate you, largely to manipulate your political perspective. And whatever they don't tell you is often the most important part of a piece of the information. What's interesting in this little encounter with Jesus here is that from this point on, the religious and the political join forces. You know, when Jesus goes to the cross, who is involved? Herod, the Pharisees, the temple, and the Romans. The religious and the political join forces, and they will all work together to bring Jesus to the cross. And Jesus will tell the Roman governor, my kingdom is not of this world. 
So let's talk about how does this play out in our lives? Whatever you look at, whatever you focus on, becomes the most important thing. This is why I left social media a long time ago. It's why I limit my news and my general media consumption. And it's why I've been disengaged from the political frenzy. I really keep a very low profile on all those things. You know, one thing I learned about social media is that people put on social media whatever they're thinking. And I quickly learned that I really did not want to know what other people are thinking. It's terrifying. You know, when I was living in the United States, I learned that there were three things you hear about regularly in the church. You hear about politics, money, and doing more stuff. And when this is your grid, you will see it everywhere. Like attracts like. And likewise, when your heart is filled with scripture, and when you are in the presence of God and you surround yourself with amazing spirit-filled people, you begin to see that everywhere. I would be cool if they could do some research on this at the quantum physics level, because I, I think we discover things. When you look at things, this is why Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is beautiful, think on these things. This is why. This is why we need to regularly speak out good things. This morning, I was on the Igniting Hope website again. And I just found I needed a declaration for today to get me through the day. And Steve Backlin, I went on there and there was a great one. You know, there is always a solution. It's always a solution. I posted it on the Mighty Network this morning. The other day, my friend Liz, we were sitting, having dinner alone. And she started asking me about my health. It was kind of interesting because her perspective on my health situation was very different than the reality. and. I told her, I said, well, I'm in good health. She was a bit shocked. I have a chronic health issue. I have to take medication, but I'm in very good health. And she said, wow, how is that possible? And I said, well, part of it is prayer. You know, God has healed me more than once. But then I said, part of it is from Psalm 118. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord, which we declare every month. Another is from Psalm 103. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall be continually on my mouth, who heals all your diseases and forgives all your iniquities. You know, you say these things. I choose to speak a kingdom perspective over my life every day. And let me tell you, there are days I do not feel like it. There are days I don't like it. But sometimes you just have to shift your reality. You have to speak over your situation. Sometimes when things are not going well, I have to stop myself, stop my emotions, and stop where they are manifesting in my body. Here's an interesting thing. You know, when you have an emotion, you usually have a picture and if you have a picture, that picture generally manifests someplace in your body. I learned this years ago when I was learning about doing the examine. There's a great book about the examine called Sleeping with Bread. And they talk about paying attention to the patterns in your life. And when you have these patterns, pay attention to where you feel the pattern in your body. Then put your hand on that place. Now, for me, it's always in my tummy most of the time when I feel anxiety. Sometimes I feel it at the back of my shoulders, but mostly it's in my tummy. They so said, put your hand on your tummy, quiet yourself, and ask the Lord for a picture. Here's an interesting one. So I had a great lump in my tummy about one issue, housing, which, as you know, has been a struggle. And one day I, I just said, Lord, what's the picture? And I had a memory, something from my childhood, where I was being held responsible for some of the housing issues my parents were having. I'd taken on that burden. 
that is one of these things that's that's not the kingdom perspective. And it was an emotion. And when you have these emotions, they affect your prayers. They affect your speech. So you have to stop yourself. So sometimes when things are difficult, stressful, you have to stop. You stop yourself. And then you pay attention to where you're feeling it. And then you have to realize that the the emotional response is always your earthly perspective. You take a deep breath. And then your mind, when your mind starts to rev up and you start to think about all the ways you have to fix this problem, this, this earthly perspective is what's going to get you sick. It's going to get you anxious. It's going to make you stressed out. So you have to stop this emotional response and you, you can feel it rise up whenever it happens. You know, you hear no, hear news and you feel it rise up. It takes practice. But in that moment, you can choose to have a kingdom perspective. You can stop. I take a deep breath. I breathe in through my nose, out through my mouth. And I say, just like uh, Agnes Sanford did, okay, soul, speak to your soul. She called her soul junior. I say, okay, soul. You need to get in alignment with the kingdom. So you just calm down, settle down, soul. It's going to be all right. And then you ask God for his perspective. So you stop and you listen. This is real. It's real. So in the midst of the trial, I have to stop and say in these moments, okay, I'm a blessed person. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. There's always a solution. All things will work together for good in my life because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. God has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. And in that moment, in the pause, you get the perspective of Jesus. Because the worldly perspective is always going to be either these two things. It's either going to be I have to do something to make God do something. Or I'm going to have to do something to make people do something. That's what that's what these the political and religious is. It's either manipulating God or manipulating people. It's really that simple. And neither is the kingdom. So you get back to the perspective of Jesus. So the people came to trap Jesus, and they were invested in the world system. And spiritually, they knew that he was not one of them. And the religious and the political spirit, when they discover this, go on a search and destroy a mission. And of course, in this story, that mission ends at the cross. There's one final thing here we need to keep in mind. Jesus points out something that would have been obvious to both of these people, these Jews. Give to God what belongs to God. And they know this verse from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world who all who dwell therein. Everything belongs to God. God owns everything already. God made Caesar, even if Caesar called himself a God. God made everything. So to them, he says, why are you lowering your standard? Look up and get a higher point of view. Jesus was pointing them to himself and to the kingdom, and they knew it. So we're going to end this time today with a little prayer, some prayer time. 
we're going to do a short version of, of my normal trauma ministry prayer today, in part because uh, we're living in traumatic times. It's hard not to leave the house and not be traumatized right now. I mean, we're living in a crazy chapter in history that someday in books, they'll explain it to people what's going on. We don't know what's going on, but it's 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 big. We're in a big time. So let's just quiet ourselves. We're going to get our soul a little healed up today, okay? So let's start with, if you need to forgive somebody, and sometimes we have to forgive isms, you know. We have to give forgive those vague, uh, abstract things. But there are some things we need to forgive. You know, some of you might need to forgive the Palestinians and Hamas. And some of you may need to forgive the Israelis. Seriously. So, Lord, you know, these are times of war. We have to keep our heart right. So, maybe you need to forgive your next-door neighbor. Sometimes it's the people we're closest to we need to forgive, so. Just see them, release them to the Lord. I find you can just send people off. I like it when forgiveness makes people smile. That's good. And now you need to forgive yourself for any sinful reaction you've had to other people's sin. So just say to yourself, fill in the blank, blank. I forgive you for every sinful reaction. It might be anger, it might be resentments, it might be addictive patterns. Now, if there's someone you need to release, or now let's just release God from every way we've held him responsible. So Lord, I, I release you from every way that I've held you responsible for the things that have happened or happening. I know that these things are not your will for my life. We live in a broken world and we've and I've held you responsible for that brokenness. So I release you from every way I've held you responsible and put a wedge between me and you today. I'm going to take authority over anything that will not bow its knee to the name of Jesus. We especially take authority over the spirit of fear today. Grief guilt and shame, anger, rage, control, every lying spirit, spirits of, of infirmity, you have to go, you have to leave us now. Anything related to sexual immorality or perversion, you have to go now in Jesus' name. Anything else, you have to go to Jesus. Go to the cross. You have to leave the person who's listening. Now, Lord, we receive your healing. We ask you, Lord, to go into every place where trauma has left. Go in deep, Lord. <clears throat> Send your light deep into every place. Bring healing, wholeness, restoration. And we declare that there would not only be a healing of the soul, but a healing of bodies today. Thank you, Lord, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. We thank you, Lord. We Declare that new creation is being manifested in our midst today. Thank you, Father. Now put your hand on the right side of your head. Great. <clears throat> we take authority over every neural pathway in Jesus' name. Any neural pathway connected to trauma or the worldly perspective, we cut off. Thank you, Lord, Father, that you are the vine dresser. So we cut off every neural pathway 
that is not bearing good fruit right now, call it, cut it off, and we declare new neural pathways right now connected to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, wholeness, freedom, shalom. Speak over all the areas that are trigger points in your life connected to your five senses. You can no longer be triggered. We disconnect them in the name of Jesus. Mm. We speak over your sleep patterns that they would return to normal, that you would have the sleep patterns God ordained for you because the Bible says that the Lord gives to his beloved sleep. Thank you, Lord, that you're wanting to heal. And so we speak over the, the memory centers of our brain. All the negative memories connected to trauma that block us from receiving and, and remembering good things. We, we say you must pass from the body as waste. We call forth all the good memories in life to manifest that they would be accessible. We take authority over the disease thought patterns that they, those, those grids would be broken in Jesus' name. And we speak over the pleasure centers of your brain, that your body chemistry would return to normal, that your adrenaline, cortisol, <clears throat> dopamine levels would all return to normal. Thank you, Lord. And that any patterns of triggering your pleasure centers through habits and addictive patterns to self-regulate would be broken now in Jesus' name. You can put your hand down. Father, I bless every person. We bless the adrenal glands. We bless the uh, lymphatic system. We bless all the uh, gland, glandular systems of the body. We bless your nervous system. We bless your skin, your hair, your teeth, all your bones. We bless your circulation. We bless your respiratory system, your digestive tract, your reproductive tract. We bless all the <clears throat> systems of your body that they would be restored and you would, you would experience healing and peace, shalom. And Lord, we ask you to surround every person listening today in the midst of these difficult times that when things rise up, there'd be that ability to pull back and say, okay, soul, Let's get a kingdom perspective. I choose shalom today. I choose health. I choose rest. I choose the kingdom for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I don't have to give time to any other voice, any other agenda, but yours, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Help us rightly discern the times we live in. Thank you, Lord. Father, we seal this prayer in the name of Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, for angelic protection to surround everybody so that nothing is lost or stolen. In Jesus' name. Thanks for listening. If these messages have helped you, please like, subscribe, support, and share. You can find out more about Belonging House Fellowship in the description. No matter what's happening in your life, remember, fear not, God can be trusted.